Hi, y'all. Do you remember in the wake of the election of this year when the New York Times put out an, a letter to its readers saying that they were going to aim to rededicate themselves to professional journalism? They were going to aim to rededicate themselves to hard-hitting, objective, factually-based analysis and delivery of the news to keep the American people informed? Remember that joke? It's a good one. Although, I guess there's a bit of an oddity there where they're not technically telling a lie because uh, if, you, if you aren't dedicated to something in the first place, so if your dedication level is zero, then it is actually trivially, e trivially easy to rededicate yourself to it. All you have to do is continue doing what you've been doing, which is exactly what they've done. Now, a frequent objection that I get is that I go after the low-hanging fruit. So today, I have found a Nobel laureate in economics writing on the New York Times from a, an article about a, uh, 10 days ago or something like that. So, um, the people who, would com who like to complain that I go after the low-hanging fruit are very big on complaining very light on telling me who the top shelf uh, fruit is. Anyway, so uh, it's an article about Trump's election written by a guy named Paul Krugman. Uh, and uh, the long and the short of it is is that, that Trump really is Hitler. But uh, it's interesting because it's written by a guy named Paul Krugman. So I guess when Trump turns into Hitler, Trump could rename the U.S. Navy to the Krugs Marine. Anyway, on to the article. Uh, the parts I want to talk about. But the 1930s isn't the only era with lessons to teach us. Lately, I've been reading a lot about the ancient world. Initially, I have to admit, I was doing it for entertainment and as a refuge from, the, uh, from news that gets worse with each passing day. But I couldn't help noticing the contemporary resonances of some Roman history, specifically the tale, uh, the tale of how the Roman Republic fell. This is just one of those examples, I think, where you're reading something and you're just waiting to work it into a conversation, and so you've got to, like, really really reached to, to shoehorn it into the conversation, but he's done it. We'll get to that later. Here's what I learned. Republican institutions don't protect against tyranny when powerful people start defying political norms. And tyranny, when it comes, can flourish even while maintaining a Republican facade. Um, when the political norm is, in and of itself, overtly corrupt, it's the duty of people to start, like, throwing off that new norm. So that's... The, the notion that just because something is a norm means that it should be perpetuated is, is fatuous. There are many things that have traditionally in history been done that we don't do anymore because as we learn, we put aside the bad things in the past and try to improve ourselves. And we're coming off of... Well, I don't need to go back over the election. Thank you for punctuating that point for me, uh, Kat. On the first point, Roman politics involved fierce competition among ambitious men. But for centuries, that competition was constrained by some uh, seemingly unbreakable rules. Here's what Adrian Goldsworthy, uh, Gold, Goldworth, Goldsworthy's In the Name of uh, Rome says. However, it was important, uh, however important it was for an individual to win fame and add to his and his family's reputation, this should always be subordinated to the good of the Republic. No disappointed Roman politician sought the aid of a foreign power. America used to be like that, uh, with prominent senators declaring that we must stop uh, partisan politics at the water's edge. But now we have a president-elect who openly asked Russia to help smear his opponent. Yes, by asking Russia to publish uh, such emails of hers as they had that would expose her, her uh, behavior. It's not like he said, hey, Russians, can you cook up and gin up a story here and ship it to us? Tell us what you know. Anyway, uh, I'll talk about this in another video at another time, but Russia is not the boogeyman of the 21st century. The evil empire is gone. Sure, Russia has problems, and they're not exactly our best friend, but a lot of people can't seem to get out of the mindset of treating modern-day Russia as though it's uh, the current Soviet Union. Anyway, um, to help smear his opponent, and all indications are that the bulk of his party was and is just fine with that. A new poll shows that Republican approval of Vladimir Putin has surged even though, or more likely precisely because, it has become clear that Russian intervention played an important role in the U.S. election. Winning domestic political struggles is all that matters. The good of the Republic be damned. So, consider what just happened in North Carolina. This is where it gets good. The voters made a clear choice, electing a Democratic governor. The Republican legislature didn't openly overturn the result, because it couldn't, uh, not this time, anyway. It can't tomorrow, or the next election. It's the funny thing about those elections and the laws. Uh, 
anyway, in constitutions, legislatures aren't free to do certain things, anyway. But it effectively stripped the governor's office of power, ensuring that, he w uh, that the will of the voters won't actually matter. Now, consider what this guy's complaint was. He was talking about the fall of the Roman Republic and how it did not begin with Caesar. The problem with Rome uh, was the concentration of power. It's too much of it's being reposed in too few, uh, too few people, or in this case, one particular person, you know, the emperor. So uh, let's go look at what just happened in North Carolina. So among some of the bills, uh, I'll talk about this one. Senators passed one of the major bills, which removes partisan control of the state and county election boards from the governor. Currently, the boards, which set hours and polling places and adjudicate ballot disputes, have a majority from the governor's party. Under the new law, the boards will have bipartisan membership, but a Republican will lead the state board during election years and a Democrat in non-election years. Maybe there's some sour grapes in there, but this is a good idea. It, it, make, it makes sure that the governor and his party do not also control the elections at the local level, that there is some opposition there on the boards to, uh, to, with power to make sure that things are being done right. This is the legislature sucking power away from the governor and returning it to the governments that are closest to the people. So, uh, unlike Rome, where the power is being concentrated in ever fewer people, it seems like in North Carolina, power is being diffused among more and more people. Uh, the House passed another key bill, enhancing the power of the state superintendent of education, who is a newly elected Republican, and mandating Senate approval of Mr. Cooper's, the incoming governor, uh, Mr. Cooper's cabinet appointments, a significant shackling of the governor's authority. So, if I read this correctly, what's happening in North Carolina is exactly what happens at the federal level. The chief executive nominates, and then the legislature uh, gives its advice and consent, or withholds its, uh, gives its advice and withholds its consent. And this is said to be a shackling of the governor's authority. Yes, it's weakening the governor uh, by making it so he cannot just go around and engaging in cronyism without being checked. This is a check to balance out the power of the governor in the state of North Carolina. A system so wise that it was written in a famous document I've read somewhere uh, that has that managed to um, presage the rise of the most powerful country ever to have existed. So this noble laureate in economics, incidentally, uh, as Christopher Hitchens said about the uh, the poet laureate of the United Kingdom, apparently becoming the poet the poet laureate of the United Kingdom makes you start writing drivel as opposed to poetry for some reason. Apparently, getting the Nobel Prize makes you start writing really retarded shit for some reason. So unlike the, the great tyranny of, con of the uh, concentration of power in a strong executive, um, he's trying to cite as an example of the problems of Rome a state where the exact opposite is happening. I think what he's counting on is that a lot of people won't click the link to go read. Gee, what was in that article he linked to? Oh, it looks like uh, power is being stripped away from the governor and given to the people, as I mentioned. It could be uh, sour grapes, the Republicans and, and the uh, General Assembly there may well have had bad motives, but a good end brought about by bad motives is still a good end. Or another way to say it is, if you rob a bank and realize one of the ch uh, coin um, bags that you have is just too heavy for you to continue holding on to and uh, running away from the police, and you give all that money to a homeless man, that homeless man just got a lot of money, notwithstanding the fact that the, the uh, burglar, or the thief, stole it. The previous bad motivations of the person, the fact that he's giving it away not because he's generous, but because he's trying to get away from the cops and this is slowing him down. The, the bad motivation to do a good thing, uh, I'm sorry, the bad motivation to do a thing that turns out to be good is still a good thing that was done. And it is a good thing when power is not concentrated, it's not reposed into few people. That's precisely uh, what the United States is founded on. And by golly, if it's a principle sufficiently good uh, to to base um, the United States on, to base a country on that would become the world's sole dominant power, uh, a, a reasonably just society at that, you know, in its dealings around the world, not perfect, but reasonably just. If it's good enough to do that, then I say, by golly, it's good enough to do some work in North Carolina. Have a great day.